try to really bring back our economy. In addition, due to our geographic expanse, transportation is a big barrier for a host of things, whether that's employment or getting to the doctor's office, getting to the grocery store. It just creates a lot of issues in our community. In addition, it's really difficult for us to recruit and maintain our clinical workforce. And so we are a, uh, we have a high HIPSA score, which means we're a health professional shortage area. And are you guys as well? Yeah, I assume so. So we too are in that same boat. We've got low graduation rates and one in five people are living in poverty. Does that sound familiar to your community? Yeah. Despite those challenges, we've been able to make a lot of progress and although we're not nearly to where we want to be, we're getting there. And in addition, the Robert Wood Johnson County Health Rankings kind of give us a, a reality check every year. And since they started putting those rankings out since 2011, we've been at or near the bottom. And we really want to try to bring up those scores. Obviously, it's not just about a score, but it's a good gauge for us. And that's what we're really using as a wake-up call and a call to action every single year. So in 2012, second year in a row, we we're at the bottom of the health rankings and we said, gosh, we got to do something about this. At the same time, public health accreditation was ramping up. Our local hospital, which is a nonprofit, they have to do a community health needs assessment every year. Our federally qualified health center, our FQHC, they had to do a community health assessment, and then CCOs were ramping up. They too had to do a community health assessment. So we said, this is the perfect time. Let's do one unified community health assessment and see where we're at. And not only was it the right thing to do, but because each one of those agencies had that requirement to do a health assessment, it was a really easy and natural choice to do that. We needed to come under the uh, common platform, and so Healthy Klamath was that platform. We also decided that we wanted to have a website that could be that landing page and a central hub of health improvement information. And so what we call the core four, so the CCO, hospital, public health, and FQHC, pitched in money to get the Healthy Klamath website. And it not only housed our health assessment, our health improvement plan, local health indicators, but then we could modify it to have whatever we wanted. So we have things like an events calendar and um, other initiatives that have to do with health, but maybe indirectly, like graduation rate improvements, those kinds of things. It's all housed within this website. And so that gave us this common platform to really rally around. So 2012, we conducted our first CHA, which is a community health assessment, and then that was followed by our 2013 CHIP, our community health improvement plan. So remember those two acronyms, because I'll use them a lot. So fast forward a couple of years, and sorry, this is kind of bugging me out. This is, oh, no. um, okay, so fast forward a couple of years. We've done three iterations of our CHA and our CHIP. And we've actually seen quite a lot of success. And the Robert Wood Johnson Culture of Health Prize came about and we said, you know, I think there's some cool things happening here. Maybe we should throw our name in that hat. And we looked at the criteria for the Culture of Health Prize and there was these six criteria that we had to demonstrate excellence in. So we looked through that and we tried to figure out like, what initiatives are happening. Can we hit each one of those buckets? So the six criteria were defining health in the broadest possible terms. And this is something I think Klamath has really excelled in, and I challenge all of you to think in these ways, because it's not just how do we get people to the doctor's office, how do we get people to take their meds correctly, which are important, but defining health in terms of public safety and food access and transportation and those other criteria, the social determinants of health, how are we demonstrating those? We also had to look at committing to sustainable systems changes and policy-oriented long-term solutions. So those of us trained in public health have heard about the socio-ecological model. There's these different um, layers of influence of our behaviors, right? Education's at the bottom, policy is at the top. What can, policy is what really makes the biggest impact, as well as systems changes. So we looked at how are we doing some of those? 
We looked at creating opportunities that give everyone a fair and just opportunity to reach their best possible health. What's this? What is that concept? Health equity. That's what that's all about. So, and that was something that I think we struggled with the most in figuring out how do we address health equity. And so I think that looks very different across every different community in the ways that they are approaching uh, health equity. And so I'll talk about how we really tied that in for our story. We looked at harnessing the collective power of leaders, partners, and community members. We all know we can't do this work alone. And it takes everyone from the retiree who just is looking to volunteer all the way up to your city council, your county commissioners, even your state and federal representatives. We need everybody involved. We also looked at securing and making the most of available resources. You, as I'm sure, are aware, uh, resources are limited and money's not falling <coughs> down from the sky. Grants are hard to get and trying to get local investments, state investments is really, really important. If those aren't around, how can you maximize the resources that you already have? So tying things into people's current jobs, those kinds of strategies are what really can help move the needle. And then finally, measuring and sharing progress results. That's really big for us. We want to tell the community what we're doing and we want them to be able to really look at the dial and see what's going on in the community. And that for us is what the Healthy Klamath website does. That's our, our repository of information. So lo and behold, we won the prize. It was a very long process. It took over a year. You had to do phase one essay, then get invited back to phase two essay as a local video. Then it was a site visit. We had multiple community meetings. And then um, it was announced that we were one of four winners in 2018. They just announced the next round of winners. I think there was six around the nation. And so it's, it's just pretty exciting to see what other communities are doing. If you haven't looked at the Robert Wood Johnson Culture of Health Prize website, I really encourage you to do so because there's so many cool things going on around the nation in both urban and rural communities. And you can watch their videos, there's big write-ups. I mean, they, they give you the works. And even we have looked at those other videos and been like, hmm, I think we can copy that. Let's get a hold of those people. So really, it's, it's rwjf.org slash prize. So I highly encourage you to look at that. Okay. So I'm not going to cover all of these initiatives, but I want to just highlight some of them and then if you're kind of thinking like, oh, I remember you mentioned Klamath Promise, can you tell me more about that at the end? I'm happy to do so. What we really looked at was what were we doing in policy, people, and places. And so we've got really great work going on in the food systems. Klamath Promise is a graduation and um, it's a graduation initiative also aimed at reducing chronic absenteeism in K through 12. Public safety, like I said, our uh, local law enforcement has really ramped up and they're doing a lot of great community work. That's not the traditional <laughs> patrolling and writing tickets, that kind of a thing, you know, it's gone way beyond that. Great, uh, great improvements in our built environment and a lot of investments that have been made by multiple partners and I'll talk about that. A lot of work in the tobacco policy realm and you know this whole vaping thing that threw us for a loop and now we're trying to figure out how do we address that. Health equity like I already talked about. Klamath Works is both a campus and a program and um, and that's really aimed at self well self-determination in terms of people trying to get back into the workforce learn life skills like here's how to be a good tenant and here's how to cook for myself and here's how to get a job and maintain a job. And then the Klamath Works campus is a central hub of services where uh, community health workers and the mission and the sobering station and different social services and health services are located on the campus. So that's the concept behind that. The rural campus which is an OHSU initiative that I'll talk about in a little bit. And then data sharing. That was something that we got a lot of compliments on just for the Healthy Klamath website. Okay. So food systems. This one has been kind of our, our shining star. And really I would say it is a combination of the right timing and the right people. Because people drive the work. And we have had a couple of visionaries come into key positions and they really had some good ideas that they were able to implement. 
So this first picture over here is of the produce connection. So our local food bank has an amazing director, and her vision was to bring fresh, free produce and give it out in the community, no questions asked. So she partnered with the Oregon Food Bank to help supply fresh produce, but then she also has partnered with local farmers and just individuals who have big gardens who are donating local produce to, to her program. In 2014, they distributed 65,000 pounds of fresh, free produce. By 2016, the program had increased almost tenfold, and they distributed 600,000 pounds at 14 sites and four sub-sites. So a sub-site would be something like, we have the park and play program and the free lunch, and then they also happen to have this free produce there. That's what a sub-site is. Fast forward to 2018, her goal was to move one million pounds of fresh produce, and she did it. She and all of the volunteers. And so that was huge for our community. And we tried to strategically put these produce connection sites around the community so there's some out in Sprague River, which is an hour and a half from Klamath. We put it at the, at the clinic, two of our clinics. So people coming out of their doctor's appointment, there's some produce for you. We put one at the wellness center. We put it at the parks. We put one at a church. And so this was a really great example of how are we equally distributing this food. Again, no questions asked. You don't have to show documentation, nothing like that. All you have to do is sign your name and how many people are in your household. That's it. And this has been wildly successful. And it's not just, you know, oh, there's the potatoes and the onions. It's really good stuff. I mean, cherries and grapes and apples and oranges and you name it, they probably had it. It's really great. And something that the director of the food bank talked about was that she saw a 20% drop in food box need because they were able to supplement <coughs> their food by these produce connection sites. They were also able to stretch their SNAP or their WIC dollars because, again, they're able to supplement their, their food sources with the produce, which is really great. And then the last thing that she really raved about was because it was free, moms and dads were more likely to get something that maybe their kids or themselves had never tried before. And so they were being introduced to new, fresh um, fruits and vegetables. In addition, they ended up writing some grants and they got a trailer and they put grills on them. And then they did another grant and they got those little grill um, like pan thingies. So you can, you can chop up fruits and vegetables, you put it on this little grill pan, you put it onto the grill and so it doesn't fall in. Anyway, they did a bunch of cooking demonstrations at the parks and at some of these other produce connection sites. And so that was something that they were able to show people. Not only here's some fresh produce, here's how you prepare it on the grill. The other really cool program is the Klamath Far Farmers Online Mar Marketplace. It's kind of a mouthful. We call it KFOM. What KFOM is, it's basically a hybrid between a CSA, which is community-supported agriculture, so you buy into a share at a farm and you get your food every week. It's a hybrid between CSA, farmer's market, and a food buyer's club. What it is, is they created this online platform, and one of the gals who really started this, she worked with our food committee through Blue Zones, and they said, how do we get local produce to stay local and get it to the community members all year long? And what she did is she got several farmers or producers, so people who had honey, eggs, meat, fresh fruits and vegetables, to basically post online what they had available that week. And then members, it's free to sign up, can go online and say, okay, I want a bag of lettuce and a, a carton of eggs and one jar of honey. And they submit their order and then on every Thursday, you go and you pick it up from a central location. And they accept snacks which was a really big accomplishment for us. And I'll give you a little bit of a few stats here. So let's see. So they have 509 registered users right now and 12 SNAP users. We started out with only one SNAP user, and so we're, we're gradually increasing that. It's, it's, we would like to have more SNAP users right now, but we're still trying to build that up. But this is a really great way to, again, educate people on the importance of healthy food, local food, and here's how you get it. 
So that's been really fun for us. Now they've just revamped their website, now they can finally accept credit card for people who have credit cards, and it's just making it that much easier to access. Another really cool program that came out of our food committee, our food systems committee, was something called Finder Farmer. And so again, the, the same gal who happens to be a local farmer who had the vision for a KFOM said, you know, I think we can get some of this fresh produce to stay in our grocery stores, in our restaurants, and at our schools. So it's their third year running now, and they've hosted Find Your Farmer event. And what they do is it's kind of just a big you know, expo, and they have farmers and producers come, and then they have restaurant owners, the school uh, food buyer, and grocery store managers, and they all come and they intermingle, and they say, oh, what do you have for sale? Yeah, I can, I'll sell that at my store. Oh, you've got all these fresh potatoes? Yeah, I'll cook those up at my school. And they've made really great connections. And so now our local produce is staying local. And again, they're able to bring the farmer in and teach the kids or teach the consumers at the grocery store about here's how your food is grown, here's how we process it, now you're buying it, that's so great. And being from an agricultural community, that's really important. So that, that's been a really, really big success for us. The last piece I'll talk about in our food systems was a really interesting problem that had a really interesting solution. So downtown, we had a Safeway that had been there for <coughs> three decades. And suddenly, something happened at the corporate level and our Safeway went away. And all of a sudden we had a food desert and it had a pharmacy in it, that went away. And the downtown living area is one of our lower income areas. So that presented a big problem. And that site sat vacant for years. And people were talking about how all of a sudden they had to go to the, the corner store or somewhere else to try to get food, which is difficult, especially people with low mobility. And so, you know, fast forward a couple of years, our county commissioners, they bought the property and then found a grocer who happened to be from uh, Northern California to come and buy the property off of them, and then they partnered with Sky Lakes Medical Center to run the pharmacy in the grocery store. And so a non-traditional way of having commercial property purchased and, and have a tenant was a really big solution for us. So food desert's gone. We now have that pharmacy closed for people who can't drive all the way across town to get their, their meds. So um, goes to show you that a little bit of creativity and maybe some <coughs> non-traditional work can go a long way for us. The built environment is really big in people's health <coughs> and well-being. Klamath had a perception, I mean, we, I heard it all the time, oh, that's the armpit of Oregon. It's so trashy there, it's blighted, what are you doing? And we, have, we still have a self-esteem problem. And part of that is just appearance. That makes a big difference to both real and perceived crime, well-being, that kind of thing. We've had a couple of really cool <coughs> interventions happen. And I'll highlight just a couple of them. One was really big, a couple of gals, one was a nurse with her MPH, the other was a doctor <coughs> with her MPH, and they started the wellness center. And they were also really big about not only interpersonal health, but also community health, and they knew the, the importance of the built environment. So they got a grant and they partnered with <coughs> Dr. Ritter, who's an OIT professor in GIS, which is Geographical Information Systems, mapping. What they did is they got 60,000 medical records, redacted obviously, <coughs> and Dr. Ritter analyzed that data and plotted it on a map. And what he was looking for was what chronic diseases are most prevalent and where are they located? And these maps can um, be viewed on the Healthy Klamath website if you're interested in looking at them. So we, it overlaid things like, where are the diabetes? What neighborhoods have the highest prevalence? How old are they? And oh, by the way, what's the walkability of that neighborhood? So we looked at diabetes, blood pressure, cholesterol, obesity, and maybe that's it. But anyway, really interesting. And what he found was there was two hot spots on the map. One was a neighborhood that was predominantly older and had a high incidence of chronic disease. Another one was predominantly younger. They had high obesity, 
but not yet the chronic diseases that are associated with, with obesity. So that, that corridor was chosen for an intervention because they had the most opportunity for improvement and prevention. And the intervention was a protective bike lane. And that had a couple of reasons behind it. One is we want to get people active. We want people to feel comfortable on their bikes with their kids or walking or rollerblading or whatever it may be. And also, these kind of improvements have been shown to have economic benefit. So increasing the property values and also increasing the feeling of safety, which is big. And so they then had to go to the city council and say, we would like to do this. Can we get permission? So they hired engineers. They did all this engineering stuff. And we canvassed that entire neighborhood to try to figure out which route was going to be the best, raised money through grants. It was not taxpayer funded at all. And we were able to build about a two and a half mile stretch that goes right through this neighborhood. It has absolutely been contentious. But as the years have gone on, people are feeling better about it as they get used to it. You know, the, it was a big change. Change, you know, takes a little bit of time to get used to. We're now in the phases of looking to fund the next section of it because the overall vision is to connect Moore Park, which is the crown jewel of Klamath Falls, all the way to downtown and have a safe corridor for people to go to and from. We also, a few years ago, there was a state report that came out, and there, there's a neighborhood called Mills, and it was labeled as one of the top five poverty hotspots in the state. And it, it just had a bad reputation, there, and there was. There was a lot of blight in that neighborhood, a lot of crime in that neighborhood, and so one gal who was relatively new to the community said, I don't like that label. I think we need to join forces and do something about this bad label. So she started a neighborhood association. And what they did is they went and they approached city council and they said, we need to do something about this. We need some in, uh, investment that's very targeted to our, our, our neighborhood here. So the city ended up putting out mini grants to make small changes such as, I'm gonna give you money to paint the fence. I'm gonna give you money to paint your house or I'm gonna give you money to fix up those broken windows. They also worked with the police the uh, local police chief, and they said, we want more of a police presence down here. And we don't want it to necessarily be punitive, but we want to feel good about where we're living. And so the police chief looked at data for what kind of crime was happening there. Because if it's not burglary, then that's not where they should be targeting their, their efforts. If it's just blight, or if it's speeding, or something like that, he wanted to be very intentional. About what kind of patrols they were doing. So they increased their patrols and they also helped out on a big community cleanup event. And so they told the, the neighborhood, if you've got junk in your front yard and you want it to go, put it out on your sidewalk, we're gonna haul it away. That got a little bit out of control and people put big things <laughs> out there and it wasn't just a few. I think it took about five days the county came and they said well, you can dump it for free at the landfill, but it was like refrigerators and couches and mattresses and you name it, it was there. But but people felt really good. They said the, the community and our leaders are focusing on us, they're helping us out, they want to make it look better. They also partnered with code enforcement and they said there's so much blight around here, it makes people feel bad and it feels dangerous. So they said, okay, instead of just writing tickets, they're, they're gonna give just warnings of, hey, this car's been out here for however long, it's broken down, get rid of it, and you've got X amount of time, or then we'll come back and ticket you. And then they created a new ordinance of, you can only have boarded up windows for, I don't know, 60 days, and then they need to be fixed. And so that, all of those different changes have really helped the built environment to feel better. And now it just, you know, two years later, we're seeing new businesses coming in, new buyers coming in. They say, you know, this, this neighborhood's kind of up and coming. I want to come here. And that business has been wildly successful. It also got the attention of the hospital and our CCO. Uh, CCO is a coordinated care organization, if you don't know. And they made big investments into the local park in that neighborhood. So it used to be kind of like the druggy hangout and people didn't want to go there, and there literally were needles all over the place. 
And so they invested, I think, $60,000 or something like that. They closed their office for a day. They came out. They were the ones helping to revamp stuff. And now it's a beautiful park, and it's always filled out. So those kind of built environment investments have made such a big difference in some of our poorest neighborhoods. And that's why it's really important to really work together and figure out what can each division do to make a difference. In addition, a couple of other more preparation type activities that we've done is we've created an urban trails master plan and a safe routes to schools master plan. And the reason those are important is, one, we needed to systematically look at how are people actively commuting or just you know, walking to the grocery store or walking to the park. And we needed to figure out what treatments are needed where and how much are those going to cost. Because you often come across grant opportunities that need the shovel-ready projects. Well, we had nothing that was shovel-ready because we'd never done a really thorough analysis. And so we were able to get some grant funds to do the planning portion. And then we were able to go to both our city council and our board of county commissioners and get these plans adopted so that when those infrastructure grants did come out, we did, we were ready. And we said, okay, we've got $200,000, let's look through our little menu of options, let's find a $200,000 one or less. Mm -hmm. And it's been really, really helpful for us to be thoughtful about where those investments happen. of what some of our work has looked like is on the policy realm. Like I said, the policy is kind of on that upper tier of level of influence. Tobacco was really big for us because, one, we have really high tobacco use rates, and two, so much work for years has been going on in the tobacco policy and prevention realm that we were a little more ready for those kinds of changes. What we did is we conducted tobacco retail assessments. So we went into every tobacco retailer and we just looked, what does it look like? What are they selling? Where are they advertising things? Are they close to schools or uh, you know, other childcare facilities? Those kinds of things. And then we partnered with the GIS, the mapping department, and Dr. Ritter is able to plot out our tobacco retailers in relation to our schools. And we were able to demonstrate to our local officials, look, 50 feet away from the school, they're advertising all of these tobacco products, flavored tobacco products that are really enticing to kids. And that was a pretty powerful message. And they said, no, kids are always the sure win, right? We want to protect our kids. And so that was really how we were able to pass tobacco retail licensing. Because in addition, the state conducts what they call SINAR inspections. So the state does like secret shoppers and they see, are they selling to youth? Well, one in three of our youth were able to successfully purchase tobacco from our retailers. Big problem. And so tobacco retail licensing passed. And we had to kind of go the extra mile because the way our city limits are laid out, it's really patchwork. So we had to pass it both in the city and in the county to be effective at all. And luckily we were able to do that. So now we have tobacco retail licensing and we just finished about half of our next round of inspections, and out of 20 retailers, we only had one fail, which is a really big improvement for us. We're trying to keep the tobacco out of the youth hands. So that was a tool that we used. Looking forward, we're hoping to potentially strengthen our tobacco retail license ordinance to potentially say, you know what, we don't want tobacco retailers within a quarter mile of our schools. So we haven't gotten there yet, but that's really where we're looking for the future. In addition, we, so for years, I mean, even when I very first started, seven years ago as a tobacco prevention coordinator, we were looking at tobacco-free parks. And time and time again, our local <laughs> official, our elected officials said, you know what, we're just, we're not ready to go there yet. And we did cigarette butt cleanups and all kinds, you know, interviews and all kinds of things. And they said, well, we'll do tobacco-free playgrounds, but not all of the parks. So that was a step in the right direction. And then, Five years later, we approached it again and we said, what are we doing here? We need the whole park to be tobacco fee, to actually enforce it and to actually make a difference. And so again, it passed and we were now just working on educating the community and putting signs up and that kind of a thing. 
Our police department was also a lot happier with it being an ordinance as opposed to just a policy because then they actually did have authority to go and help us enforce that rule. We're not dedicating a ton of law enforcement resources to do those patrols, but if they're there, they actually have some teeth to do something about it. We also were looking at tobacco-free downtown as a, a blanket ordinance, and there was a ton of pushback. I mean, the whole community was divided, and there was stuff in the newspaper and all kinds of surveys and stuff happening. But a lot of downtown businesses, and especially event, event organizations, so like our Cinco de Mayo event and the farmer's market event, were really supportive of having a tobacco-free event. So we really met in the middle and we said, let's just do tobacco-free downtown events. That's a great place to start. And even some of the biggest opposition had said, yeah, I can, I can get on board with that. And so just maybe a month and a half ago, downtown, or I'm sorry, tobacco-free downtown events passed. So again, we're just kind of chipping away at the iceberg to try to create a more healthy environment so we can role model, make it more family friendly. And our downtown events have not suffered participation. You know, we had the rest of our farmer's market events, we've had a couple of parades. People are all about it, which is really cool. The last thing that we're working on, and this is you know kind of the pie in the sky idea, but we're going for it anyway, is a wellness zone. So our hospital is co-located with Oregon Tech. And each one of those campuses is tobacco free. So where do people go to use their tobacco? right in the middle of the street. That's not safe for those people, and it's a bit of an eyesore. But aside from just going tobacco-free, we said, let's really promote wellness in this whole area. So we looked at where are all of the Sky Lakes properties that are not just the main hospital, there's other clinics around, and wrapping in OIT, and we said, we want to create a wellness zone that is not only tobacco-free, but also how are we promoting nice walking trails and publishing where those are located? We're looking at a bike share program to be in that zone. And we're also helping to promote healthy foods. And so we, the hospital has now implemented a farmer's market at the hospital. And I think it's every other week or something like that. So again, local produce coming to the hospital where the sickest people are. So that kind of a, a strategy is what we're going for. And it'll take an ordinance, and it'll take a lot of interviewing and focus grouping and creating buy-in, but why not try, right? So that's really where we're going with systems change, built environment change, policy change. I mentioned this very early on in the presentation, but we have a community health worker program. And it started in 2015, and we had three community health workers and 25 participants that were given to us by our local CCO. And the whole idea behind this community health worker program is we want to give a hand up, not a hand out. So how do we help people navigate resources and then help them to become independent on their own? And we found very quickly that people didn't just need help getting to the doctor's office. They needed help understanding how to pick up their medications, how to put their meds in their little boxes, how to get to the grocery store, how to buy healthy things with their SNAP dollars, how to access the produce connection, how to find housing. I mean, it was a huge undertaking. And when this program first started out, it was just non-emergent non medical transportation only. But that was pretty ineffective. People needed more than just a ride. They needed all those things I just talked about. And so these community health workers started training on how to navigate some of these other systems. We also very quickly realized we need more than three community health workers. So we increased how many community health workers have, we now have 12. We also brought on <coughs> three nurses and two social workers slash behaviorists. Because we also noticed, gosh, there's a big intersection between your mental health and your physical health. And this, this is data for just the 2017-2018 fiscal year, but we really wanted to look at what kind of impact is this program having on, the, on the, their participants. So we had actively engaged almost 700 participants, and these were mostly 
people on Medicaid, a few on Medicare, a some who were uninsured. We provided almost 10,000 home visits, office visits, and phone calls. So we were trying to have a high touch program here to really keep people engaged and make them feel like they were cared for. We provided um, about 1,800 rides to health locations. So oftentimes it was the doctor's office, the dental office, the mental health office, but sometimes it was places like the YMCA or to the grocery store or to the DHS building. And that was really important for us because, again, the social determinants of health are huge. And transportation needs to be for things beyond just the doctor's office. We then analyzed how often they were going to the emergency department and how often they were being readmitted and just plain admitted into the hospital. The CCO and the hospital have certain incentive metrics or they were in programs that really relied on outcomes of their patients. And readmissions was a big one and ED utilization is another big one. And there are dollars tied to those things. So going from just, yes, we care about our patients, but then also if we can get these extra dollars, we can reinvest it into our community. So we looked at people who had been on this community health worker program a year prior a year during and a year after. And what we saw was a 35% reduction in emergency department visits, and we saw a 49% reduction in admissions. And we worked with um, some statisticians, and those were statistically significant outcomes, which is great. So not only are people feeling better about getting their care at appropriate places, like their primary care provider, or not needing to go to the ED, but then those dollars that were saved were in fact reinvested. So the hospital was able to invest a ton of money and renovated another park in town. The CCO was able to reinvest that money into a park in town. And that again influences the environment. So we're trying to really have this holistic look of, okay, we've got these extra dollars, what are we gonna do with it? And so that's been really important. Another piece of this puzzle is how do we get medical providers in town and to stay in town? We've been very fortunate that we've had uh, Oregon Health Science University partner with us at the local hospital. So we already had a nursing program that was co-located at the OIT campus. And we've had a couple of local physicians and other leaders in the community say, I think we can do more. I think we can bring more people in to have a rural clinical experience and I think we can entice them whether to stay in Klamath Falls or to practice at another rural community. And that's really important for people like us, right? And so this, this building here is in construction right now. It's slated to open in January. But what it is is a co-located campus that will not only have clinics in it for people to come to their primary care provider, but then it also is a place for clinicians from medical fields, so we've got PAs, nurse practitioners, we have a residency program, dental students, uh, pharmacy students, and we're hoping to eventually get public health students. And they come for rotations in the community. So they're, they have to do a clinical rotation, and then they also have to participate in a collaborative community-wide project. So right now they're soliciting people like public health and, and OSU Extension and the food bank and they say, we need a project idea that's going to help the whole community, and these rural campus students are going to rotate in and out and help, help you do that project. And it has been really successful because we've actually had some rural students come back for employment in Sky, er, at Sky Lakes and Plymouth Open Door and try to help. Or they've gone on and said, you know, I want to practice in Prineville, or I want to go practice in, hopefully, in Roseburg, or other rural places, which is a win for us. We're also starting an on-track program which works with high school students and tries to introduce them to the medical field, whether it's doing an internship or um, just spending a day in a clinic or things like that to really entice these students who may not really know what they want to do and say, hey, the medical field is, is great, it can provide for you know, good income, education. Oh, by the way, we've got this rural campus that you can go study at. So we're really trying to build that next generation of medical practitioners. All right. 
So these are things that hopefully resonate with you. I've talked about these several programs and it all sounds hunky-dory, but it's not without struggles and barriers, right? And so I just wanted to talk about, here's some of the pros and cons of being a rural community and doing this community health improvement work. And I'm sure it will resonate with all of you. Pros, we're really close-knit. I can go to the grocery store and see the CEO of the FQHC and we can shake hands and talk about, let's do this really cool project together, right? That's great. It's also really easy to get involved because there's only so many things happening in a small community, so those are typically a little bit more in the spotlight. Maybe it's in the paper, or you hear about it on the radio, or at your kid's school, there's things going on. It's easy to get involved. And then, because we are resource poor, we have to be innovation rich. And so we're really good about being resourceful, thinking of new ideas, and, and just being kind of creative on how we get things done. Challenges, typically, at least in the past, it's been a very conservative community, and so these wild ideas like a protected bike lane can be pretty, pretty scary to deal with. And so we have to really navigate, okay, well, I'm gonna come alongside you, this, this isn't so scary, here's why we're doing it, let's canvas the neighborhood. You just have to take that extra step, right? Low funding, enough said there. The geographic spread in our outline communities, and it is really hard when we're trying to bring services, bring built environment improvements to those really outlying communities that are an hour and a half away and they have 300 residents. They do get neglected a lot, and so we're trying to figure out how do we really focus on those outlying communities beyond just the population center. And then what we found is 20% of the people do 80% of the work. So there's a lot of fatigue with people when they said, you know, of course, I'll volunteer again, but we're really trying to figure out how do we engage new people in new ways. So yeah, maybe you've been a volunteer at the library for 20 years, that's awesome, we want you to continue to do that, but if you're a little bit sick of it, maybe you can come volunteer for the trail network, and that's something totally different, and, and it's great. So we're just trying to really give people an opportunity to get involved in new ways. So like I said at the beginning, we did our community health assessment and we just finished up our 2019 community health improvement plan. And I wanted to talk quickly about that because it's really important for us as a community, and I assume you as a community, to have that strategic plan and have a map of where you're going and why. How did you get there? How did you choose these things? So we use the MAP model, which is Mobilizing Action Through Planning and Partnership, which is a CDC uh, health assessment and improvement planning model. And it really guides you very nicely through both processes. And so the health assessment we did, you do some visioning and just some community organizing. You do four assessments that are both engaging organizations as well as community members. You look at where you're, you basically do a SWOT analysis. You're looking at your strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And then you move on to the health improvement process. And so what we did is we had our community health assessment and we boiled it down to, here's just our health stats, our data. And we put that out to the community through surveys and focus groups and we said, which of these are most important to you? Or what are you already involved in? What, where do we already have assets? And from there, we were able to prioritize six main categories and that's how we chose what we were gonna prioritize in our health improvement plan. So what rose to the top for us was suicide, infant mortality, housing, food, food insecurity, oral health, and physical well-being. That was kind of our biggest, most uh, nebulous bucket. And what we did is we then figured out, so what coalitions or groups or organizations are already working on some of these things? As you can tell from earlier in the presentation, we have a lot of work already happening in the food systems. So that, that group took on food insecurity. Why are we gonna create a new subgroup if we don't have to? Let's give it to them. There was already an oral health coalition formed. They'd already done a couple of free dental days. We said, great, you guys take oral health. Suicide, the local mental health provider, and the face and behavioral health, they already had a suicide coalition up and running. They've been doing great work. Again, let's give that to them. 
infant mortality, we have a new group that had already formed because public health has Title V dollars and infant mortality was something that we knew was up and coming. So we already had a group there. So the only two that we didn't already have work going on in was housing and physical well-being. Blue Zones Project is already very involved in things that have to do with physical well-being. And so they created a new subgroup for that specifically. And really what they were working on was things like trail connectivity. They were working with our local trails alliance and looking at how can we increase participation in the programming like the wellness center that we already have. So that was kind of where they took that. Housing is a big nut to crack, right? And it's a nationwide problem. Klamath is no different. I'm sure Roseburg is no different. And so what we quickly realized was there's two buckets that we need to look at within the housing realm. One is we just need more housing. We need it to be safe, we need it to be clean, and we just need more of it. On the other hand, for the housing that we do have, some of, the, some of our residents have not been the best tenants, and they've burned a lot of bridges, and yet they still deserve to have housing. So how can we bridge that gap? So we have a programming housing task force, and we've got an infrastructure housing task force. The infrastructure one is working with the city. They just did a housing needs assessment. They're working with the Economic Development Association. They're trying to find investors. And then on the other side, we're working with that community health worker program, the housing authority, community action services, and they brought on something called the Ready to Rent program. And basically, it's it's kind of like, like a diversion program where they've been kicked out of every housing opportunity possible. If they go through this ready to rent program, which teaches them the basic skills of here's how to pay a bill, here's how to sweep up the kitchen, here's how to properly do your laundry, just life skills. And we're working with that to just try to prep people to be better tenants. In addition, we're, the health authority is working with the housing authority and we're working on a pest management program because bed bugs is huge in Klamath Falls, and no one really has the authority to address it. Public health, it's just a nuisance. Housing authority, it's this tenant landlord law kind of stuff. Nobody has the resources to really take care of it. And so we just started a new program. Um, the housing authority applied to our CCO for funds to buy heating units, which is the most effective way to get rid of bed bugs. And they partnered with public health to give instruction on Here's how to really best use those heating units, and by the way, here's the units to buy. And we now have the housing authority who has this, these heating units, and we're working with the tenants to, to clean up their homes and rid them of bed bugs. We're at the very beginning of that, but those are the kinds of interventions that we've had to integrate into things like our community health improvement plan. Very locally driven. We also knew that we needed to align our CHIP priorities with what's going on in the state and the national level. So we, there's several crosswalk tools that we use, they're from the Oregon Health Authority, and then we just you know, did some of our own homework. So we took our priority issues, I'm sorry this really, it's kind of small, but we have each one of our priority issues, we looked at the Oregon SHIP, which is the state health improvement plan, and figured out which <coughs> which buckets do our priorities fit into, and luckily it fit into all of them. We also looked at the county health rankings because we do hear about those numbers, and again, it's, it's a pretty well-rounded model, so we looked at where do we align with there, and then we of course looked at Healthy People 2020. And another really cool resource that I just learned about a, maybe a year ago is there's a rural Healthy People 2020 um, that I think it's University of Texas puts that out. And so we also looked at that. We didn't put it on this graph, but it's, it's a really great resource. With 2020 rapidly approaching, we, if, with our next iteration, we'll have to look at 2030. But regardless, it's really important to nest what you're doing with what's going on in the larger picture, not only just for funding, but then just resources in general. It's really important to do that, or at least we thought it was important to do that. And just the cool thing that we're pretty proud of is this new graphic here because we wanted to tie in what is Healthy Klamath, what are the community partners doing, and how does it fit into the health improvement plan and the health assessment. 
So around <coughs> the outside here is kind of the big buckets of who's involved in healthy climate and who has a stake in health improvement plan, which is everybody. But those are kind of the large buckets. That yellow, the darker yellow ring, is the core four. So those are the people who are the steering committee for Healthy Klamath, and they're the ones who pay for the website. Within that, you've got the health assessment and community health improvement plan. Those are our drivers of what we're doing. Around that, those blue, the blue circles, are our CHIP priority areas. And then hopefully all of this combined is going to lead to a healthier community. That's the goal, right? And something that we have realized over the past several years, again, you know, it started back in 2012, is we need people to get involved. So knowing what's happening in the community is really important. Myself as the public health director down to the, you know, my neighbor who's you know, working on a construction job, they need to know what's going on in the community. So if you're the one doing the cool stuff, Make sure to put it on your website, put it on your social media pages, get on the radio, get on to, um, you know, get into the paper if you can. It's really important to spread the word and let people self-select in, right? You can also actively recruit people because people care about their community. They want to get involved. But I think one of the bigger things is to give people options of how to get involved because they might not have time to go and help you write a grant, or they don't have time to go into a focus group with you, but they do have time to sign a letter that you wrote for them. And this has been particularly true for us because we have the, the residency program, and residency physicians have zero time, but high motivation. And so we, I worked with one of the local docs, and, and I said, what can you do? How can you help us? And he said, if you draft up this letter, I'll sign it, and then you submit it for me. Great. I will happily do that for you. Some of them have a little more time or a little more motivation, and so some of them had said, you know, can I, can I write you a letter of support for that grant? Can I show up to the city council meeting and offer testimony? Of course, I'll write you some talking points. So sometimes you have to do a little bit of hand-holding, but people want to get involved, so just give them some options. I would highly encourage that. Alternatively, you can express your interest in getting involved. Public health is lucky in that we're kind of this catch-all where a lot of things have to do with health. So if I hear that somebody's doing a cool thing, I might say, you know, I'm interested. How can I get help? What do you need help with? I may not have financial resources, but I might be able to align what one of my coordinators is doing with the work that you're doing. How can we really cross-pollinate? So really it's all about communication, right? And then the other part of that is highlight and celebrate your wins because that's another way to get, get people excited, get the word out there of, hey guys, we just passed tobacco-free parks. Let's all go and do a big event in the park. That's great. Or maybe the Trail Alliance, they want to be the ones to help you celebrate. Give that to them because they want to get involved. And if that's the only way they can do it, great, right? We also wanted to make, we want to be very transparent in what we're doing. And so we, a lot of people don't want to read a 70-page community health improvement plan, right? It's <coughs> painful sometimes, but they want to know what's going on. And so um, there's some handouts in the back, but what we did is we created this one pager that has each one of our priority areas, what the overall goal is, and what the objectives are, and the really high-level strategies. What we then have done, we haven't, it's not gone live yet, but we're revamping the Healthy Plymouth website to, to really align with our community health improvement and so we're going to have a page for each priority area. We're going to post each coalition or the work group's actual work plan. That's much more detailed than this. We're going to post quarterly updates on metrics of, hey, how many people did you have at that training? How many uh, letters to the editor did you submit? How many grant proposals did you submit? So we're going to be tracking our metrics. It's going to all be online. And we'll also have on each one of those pages, if you want to get involved, it's one click. And then we will take care of the rest for you. We're really trying to up the game with the health improvement stuff. We're being transparent, we're trying to be very focused, and, and mindful of what resources we have in town. So all of that kind of culminated, again, in our Culture of Health Prize win. And I've already taken an hour of your time, so I won't play the video for you right now. But uh, we can send out this 
this PowerPoint, you can look, there's a three minute video and there's a 10 minute video, <coughs> or it's on the Robert Wood Johnson website. And like I said, don't just look at ours, look at all those other communities, they're doing amazing stuff. And I know you guys are on your way, you've got Blue Zones Project, you've got this network, these are all the things that we have built upon. And so I feel very, very confident in all of you being able to put your name in the hat for the Robert Wood Johnson Culture and Health Prize. So with that being said, I know there was a lot of information. What questions do you have? Yeah. Each of these different organizations, hospitals, <coughs> QACs, CCOs, etc., public health departments, are required by their various regulatory bodies to have jobs and jobs. Yep. And so, uh, what did you notice in terms of these different organizations and how they, oh, and they have different frequency and cadence yep. uh, requirements. So kind of they, uh, kind of they uh, coordinate that sort of thing. Yeah, so we, we've been very fortunate in that there's been staff members from each one of those organizations who have been delegated to take that work on. And we all happen to get along pretty well. So that's lucky. But two, we had the Oregon Health Authority come down and actually put a training on for us. And they have a crosswalk tool that says, here's what the F2HCs are required to have. Here's what public health accreditation, the IRS for the hospital, and then the CCO metrics, of course. So we worked through that with each one of our stakeholders. And we even brought in our mental health provider because they, I think well, they just wanted to do it. Yeah, and so, um, and what we decided is, sure, public health doesn't need a chip until every five years, but the FQHC needs one every three. So we just decided, we'll just do one every three, because who cares, let's just do it. And um, we did, we just tried to make sure that the metrics for, for example, the CCO, were at least in the prioritization survey that we sent out into the community. and. For example, they, the CCO also had to engage their community advisory council. So we made sure to present it to the community advisory council. It took a lot of work. I mean, it was over a year long process and we had meetings all the time. And no different, from, remember back when you were in school and group projects were very painful sometimes. We had to just talk things out and say, okay, you take this section, I'm gonna take this section, I'll lead the survey, you lead the analysis. And so it's just, um, a lot of coordination, but we did have help from the state. Oh, and we did send a couple of staff members to the MAP training, which is the Mobilizing Action Through Planning and Partnership. That was very, very So helpful. the outcome then was that they, they could all use the same one? Correct. Yeah. So we used this one community health assessment and the one community health improvement plan to submit to all those entities. Did I answer it? Okay. Yeah? Um, who makes up the Klamath Health Partnership? Healthy Klamath or Klamath Health Partnership? Klamath Health Partnership. Klamath Health Partnership is our FQHC. Oh, okay. Yeah. So each one of the core four or the kind of heavy hitter partners took on responsibility for each one of our priority areas. So Klamath Health Partnership took on the oral health stuff. Public Health took on infant mortality. Blue Zones took on the physical health. Clemson Basic Behavioral Health took on um, the suicide prevention. Our CCO, Cascade Health Alliance, took on housing. Which one did I miss? Blue Zones took on food insecurity. Yeah, big question. Great, thank you. What else? So what are you doing in the next five years? <laughs> so the next five years, we are following this plan. Actually, this is our three-year plan. Okay, the next three years. So what we will hopefully soon, probably within the next month, are going to post each one of our work groups work plan. And we're just going to be working through those. And each coalition or subgroup got to make their own work plan. So for example, I'm leading the infant mortality one, so I'll speak to that one. For example, we are partnering with our local fire department to implement the DOSE program, which is direct on-scene education. And it's all about safe sleep because we have realized that these EMS personnel are going into people's homes all the time. And they are well respected and kind of um, like a non-confrontational partner. 
And so they might look around and say, it looks like an infant lives here. Can I see where your infant is sleeping? And they've been trained to identify what safe sleep or non-safe sleep environments look like. And then they can offer education, help connect them to resources. So those kinds of things are what we'll be doing in the next three years. So in, a, in like a month or so, check our Healthy Klamath website, then you can see all the stuff that we're going to be doing. Can you talk a little bit about your baseline of when you started these programs and how it's improved health status and social determinants of health of how we stack up with the counties? Mm -hmm. So I know we have a lot of discussion here that we do a lot of activities and we don't quite move that needle far enough. We struggle with the same thing. Yeah. And I'm sure you all understand that health improvement takes a lot of time, especially when you're looking at the data. So things like Burfus or the American Community Survey or those kinds of things, it might be 10 years before we see an uptick. And Klamath has not seen a big improvement in our, for example, in the community health rankings. We just haven't. But we're hoping that with the implementation of these different initiatives, we will see the improvement. And we do look at some of the more uh, minor indicators, which are the indicators that we picked for our chip. So for example, low birth weight has been a problem for us for 15 years. And so if we can see a reduction in 1%, we're going to feel really good about that. We were very intentional about choosing metrics this year that were more attainable instead of, well, here's what I actually want. That's not realistic. So for example, we did not say that we're going to see a reduction in obesity by 10%. We're just not. So maybe we'll try to see a 2%. So, no, we haven't seen a whole lot of change in our actual indicators, but we're very confident that we will. In addition, being a Blue Zones community, they do an oversample for the well-being index. And so we are, we are trying to track those, and we've seen a decline in tobacco, we've seen an increase, I think, in people's self-reported well-being. So that we're using on kind of a micro level while we have that resource. <coughs> Questions from this side? <laughs> okay. Well, uh, you, my contact information is up here. If something pops in your head, if you're too shy today, please feel free to call me, email me. Uh, you know, if you're in Klamath, please look me up. I'd be happy to show you around, take you to lunch. And with that, I guess we'll be done. Great. Right. Thank you so much. Thank you. I do want to thank everybody for uh, coming. Uh, you can understand about why I said that the uh, power is not uh, in the uh, website, and yet the website is essential. Uh, it's a it's a, a tool that brings uh, the right people together with the right hearts uh, and coordinates uh, that so uh, that it can happen. Uh, I I think there's a lot of power when we. Uh, show the problem to the right people with the right part and then give them the tools to, uh, to move on. So, uh, thanks for coming. When's our next meeting? Our next meeting is January. Uh, the... Lindsay? <laughs> date? Date, please. January 23rd, 8.30. And we're And anybody who's not on the email invite and would like to be, please sign up and we'll make sure we get you on there. And Jerry will be talking at that meeting about, about the sobering station. So. Thanks. Okay. Thank you.